optimizing for developer delight, I am not going to talk about there's no right answer because Pete and Andrew kind of already did that justice um, earlier today. And I just worked on that talk for a month and it wasn't going anywhere, so I wrote this instead. Uh, these days I work at Bizarre Voice. I'm a senior software engineer at Bizarre Voice where Alex is working for another a little bit. Um, so I said the whole currently thing. And I work on the client side framework that powers the uh, ratings and reviews and lots of other uh, applications. But our core application is a ratings and reviews third party JavaScript widget. So if you are a big retailer then, and you want to have reviews on your site, uh, then you might use the Bizarre Voice ratings and reviews product in order to get reviews on your site without you having to write all of that code yourself. And I'm working on the framework that underlies the new version of this um, system, of this software. And there's a huge motivation to get our customers switched over to this new version. Uh, the legacy version, long story short, kind of requires a lot more effort on our part. I could talk about that and the 4,000 um, XML tag options that you can set in the old version, but I won't. Uh, but there's a lot more effort that goes into configuring the old, the legacy version of the software. And the new version of the software is configurable by the client rather than by us. And so long story short, we want clients on it because that means less work for the same amount of money. That's pretty cool. So of course, customers don't want to switch to the new version of the software until the new version has all the same features as the old version has. And you know, we're, we're negotiating on some of that, but there still are features that we need to build out because they existed in the old software, they were important to clients in the old software. And before they're willing to sign on the dotted line to switch over to the new version, they need those features there. And so bottom line, the easier I can make it for developers to create new features on top of this framework in the new system. The easier I can make it for them to do that, the more money we make faster. So that's kind of the point of this talk today. And to give you a sense of scale of the framework and the application, we're talking about kind of about 25,000 lines of code for the core application and framework. Another 10,000 or so lines of tests, um, unit tests and functional tests. And if you throw in all the vendor libraries and templates and tooling and the development server and the, all these other pieces, then you get up to about 90,000 lines of code. So this isn't enormous, like this is not Gmail, um, but it's big. It's, it's probably the biggest application that I've had the opportunity to work on. So it's, it's big enough and there are some issues that arise when you have a piece of software that's th this big being worked on this by this many developers and being worked on by developers of different JavaScript skill levels. Everyone at Bizarre Voice is really smart, but some of them came from Java, some of them came from Python, some of them came from who knows where. Um, I like to make fun of the Java people, but they're still nice to me, so I appreciate that. And, uh, and so a whole bunch of different people, a whole bunch of different JavaScript skill levels, and of course also doing this all under the pressure of deadlines. And it, we had a particularly large deadline before I started working there in November, and I started working there in February. The deadline was in November. And a whole lot of stuff happened that some people may not be particularly proud of in hindsight. But we've all been there, too. So I want to make clear that none of this talk is like, oh, those dumb people I work with, Bizarre Voice, I had to go fix all their shit. No. Um, they, they wrote good code, but they did, a lot of, they did a lot of this under pressure. And so decent, side co decent sized code bases with lots of developers working on them are definitely interesting creatures because even if you have a whole bunch of really smart people working on them, you still can end up with people making decisions that are in the interest of the feature that they're working on today and not making decisions based on the interest of the code base as a whole or the developer who's going to be working on another feature tomorrow or next week or next month. And so even really smart people can make decisions that are good in the narrow case, but cause problems down the road for other people. And so what I want to talk about today is this idea of developer delight, which is probably overstating it a little bit. Uh, I don't know that anyone is like, yay, I get to work with this code. Um, I am. I'm pretty excited about working with this code, but I might be weird. So uh, developer delight, developer happiness, you know, there are lots of things that make us happy. Um, money is one. 
um, and time off, and you know, there's lots of things that are out of my control that make developers happy. But the things that are in my control uh, in this code base and, and in this job are number one, getting a clear path for getting people up to speed. So that was one of the first things that I focused on when I started at Bizarre Voice was, I don't know where to start. How do I make this easier for the next person? How do I make it so that Alex doesn't, that, that, that the you know, onboarding process isn't Alex sitting in a room with me for three hours explaining everything that I need to know? How do we make the onboarding process for this framework more, um, more automated, more, more self-serve uh, kind of thing? Number two, how do we make sure that we, we don't need all senior software engineers working on developing features because you know, there's probably a lot of senior, senior software engineers in this room. You know how many recruiting emails you're getting. There aren't enough of us. We can't, that can't be our answer is, oh, we'll just find, it doesn't matter what we're willing to pay, we can't find them. Um, number three, we wanna make sure that there are as few surprises as possible. We want the it just works. We don't want there to be any, well, I tried this and that didn't work and then I put this variable here and, or I put this argument here and then suddenly it worked so I'm just going to commit that and move on. We had a lot of that and we're trying to get away from that. We want to isolate complexity so you don't have to understand the crazy mechanisms that we use in order to do our event binding, um, which is a whole other talk that Andrew DuPont could give because he wrote all of that for us recently. So we don't want to have, you wouldn't want developers to have to understand the complex parts of the framework. We want to make it really easy so they can develop features. We want the development process to be smooth, seamless, and for them to have the information that they need. They don't, we don't want them to have to go digging for it. And finally, nothing should be more difficult than it should be. You know, we can't make everything easy, but we can make it so that nothing is harder than it needs to be. And so those are kind of the goals that I set out for myself when I joined in February. And my job, like I said, or maybe I didn't say, but my job when I joined was not to develop features, not to fix bugs, but was to focus on making this a better experience for people. And that's what I want to talk about today is kind of what I've done and things that I think are generally applicable, not just to our code base that we're working on, but to any large project that has a number of developers of different skill levels working on it. Um, and deadline, like the deadline part kind of goes without saying there's always pressure, there's always deadlines. So that's what I want to talk about. Some of the things that I'm going to talk about are so simple that you might not think to do them because they're so easy, and some of them are a little bit more complex. So I just got a, you know 22 minutes left, so let's dive in. Um, one of the <laughs> simplest things that we did was to add assertions to the framework. So simply to say, I expect this thing to be true at this moment. And so how many of you have been you know, working on a feature in, in a project and you've seen something like this? Right? Like anyone who doesn't put up their hand is just lazy because it's the end of the day. So you know, you've all seen this. And this is not a useful error. Of course, there's a lot. You can go dig up the line number and see what happened. But maybe this happened as the result of some asynchronous operation. And so you really have to go trace back where things went wrong. We added just these really simple assertions to our code base to say, I expect that right now that config is an object. I expect that it has a property of subject ID. Uh, and if these two things are wrong, blow up. Please make noise now rather than 400 milliseconds from now when the Ajax request that gets fired three lines later finally responds. And so just adding these was really simple. It's just, you know, we have this BV reporter um, BB reporter object that has this assert method on it. You can bring your own assertion, you can write your own really simple assertion function, you can bring chai or any other assertion library, it kind of doesn't matter. This is, this is kind of the simplest and dumbest thing that you can possibly do. But the nice thing about this is that with these assertions you figure out, and some of them are actually a lot more, they explain in much more detail what went wrong, and you can very easily zero in on where you have screwed up. Uh, of course, these are all no ops in production, so in production we just catch our errors and fail silently as far as the user is concerned, or even gracefully if, if we're good. Next thing is to, I'm pressing the back button, there we go. Uh, the next thing, in, in, which is also really deceptively simple, is to tell people what's going on. You know, we have this 25,000 lines of code 
The, the framework is smaller than that, but it does a whole lot of crazy things, like I was saying, as far as event delegation, and as far as how it sets up the views and everything. So just telling people what's going on is a huge win. When I showed up, this is what you saw in the console when you pressed refresh. Essentially nothing. It doesn't even matter what that says. It's just like, hey, I thought this was a font, and it's a font, but I'm going to be grumpy about it. And so this is what I saw, this is what you would see in the console when I showed up. And if you wanted to understand what was going on, especially as a new person working on this framework, it was up to you to put in console log statements all throughout the code, and then to make sure, of course, that you deleted them all before you committed, or else Aaron Forsander would um, fix it on his branch. And, and it was a really cute branch. It's like he has Kenny Powers, and he has um, um, Lintberg is his other, uh, his other branch for fixing things to make you feel guilty. So if you, if, you, if you wanted to find out what was going on, then it was up to you to put those logs in, to take them out. And then the next developer who came around was probably going to put in exactly those same logs to figure out what was going on and then have to take them out. And it's especially hard to understand what's going on when you're dealing with an asynchronous system where things are happening later and you, you know, there isn't just a clear procedural chain of, of events. So we added lifecycle logging, uh, and especially, probably the most exciting thing is these groups that we added. Chrome DevTools has console group and console group end. I, other DevTools may have it as well. We wrote this so that if it doesn't find console group and console group end, then it'll just fall back to normal console log. But what this gives us is a nested view of everything that's happening. And so when we're building this really complex view hierarchy, we can see exactly how that happens. When we're building you know, anything that happens kind of in groups, we can see when that starts and when that ends. And so now, when you are trying to figure out where something's going wrong, you can put in one console log and you can see exactly where that's happening in the whole chain of events. And we also set up different log levels so that if you don't want to see this much detail, this is actually an abnormally high level of detail. If you don't want to see this much detail, you don't have to. And so at a more normal log level, you would see more basic and important information. And again, this is really great for newcomers because when they press, when they get that server running for the first time and see the application running for the first time, they can see exactly what's happening and be like, huh, let me go look at that code that does that. It's also great for debugging because as someone who knows the framework, you kind of learn, you learn what this flow looks like. You put in your log message and you immediately know where something broke. Obligatory sniffle. This one's a bit more complex. Uh, it's kind of a hard concept to <laughs> Um, explain, it's kind of, the, the more you do this, the more you know what this means. Uh, but eliminating temptation. Again, you've got lots of different developers, possibly of different skill levels, working against a deadline. You want to eliminate opportunities for them to make bad decisions. Now, in our case, there are probably lots of different kinds of temptations, but in our case, our particular temptation was a global. It was this, you know, we use AMD, so there aren't really any globals. Um, well, there are, but that's a whole other thing. Uh, there aren't really any globals, but we had this thing called ENV, capital to make you know that it was really important. And uh, it was a dependency in just about every single file in the entire code base. Some files didn't actually use it. We actually, we have scaffolding, a scaffolding tool, that, like when you need a new feature, when you want to make a new feature, you say, make me a new feature. And it would automatically just be like, you're probably going to need ENV, so I'm just going to put it there for you. It turns out that this is really a bad idea because if you give this global to people, they will find all kinds of ways to take advantage of it in a really bad way. And so the next thing you know, the solution become, this, this global kind of becomes the solution for everything. So it was a global event bus for us. Eh. Okay. It was an error aggregator. So whenever there was an error, we would fire another event on it, and that did something else, and we'd send the error along too. It was also how we passed through analytics stuff that was going on. Yeah, cool. Um, anything that we couldn't figure out a better place to put it? ENV seems like a good place for it. It was also this magical third argument to on, trigger, set, and get. And I, I don't know that there's anyone, I can tell you now what that did, 
But when I showed up, I don't know if there was anyone who could, like any single person who could tell you exactly what that did. Uh, and of course, there were no tests for it either. So, so we, one of the things that I did, I, I saw this ENV is just like the scourge on the code base, and, and I spent months. <laughs> I think I finally got rid of almost all of the ENVs just last week. I spent months, um, the last few months, trying to eliminate this from the code base. And so maybe you implement things via a global, but that doesn't mean you need to expose the global to every single uh, every single module, every single piece of code. So now instead of saying env trigger show loading, we have a loading overlay object that we say, hey, show yourself now. And it, you know, maybe it implements it through env trigger show loading, maybe it doesn't, I don't remember. It doesn't matter, to, there, that temptation of env isn't there anymore. We create a bv tracker object that has an error method and a conversion method and a bunch of other things. So anytime that we want to track that something has happened, we now do that in the code through BV Tracker. We eliminated the magical ENV arg, which is a whole long story, but basically it was a weird pub sub system. And so we said, hey, let's make methods called publish and subscribe. And they achieve that same thing, but hide the fact that they're doing it, they're not doing it through ENV anymore. But even when they were doing it through ENV, they hid that inside of the method so that developers weren't kind of having to figure out what this magical ENV as the last argument meant or what it did. We gave them a method that was what it did. And uh, you know, one, isolated that complexity, and two, eliminated that temptation of, oh, ENV's here, let me just use it. Another thing that we did was to another kind of rule that I'm trying to enforce on the code base is this idea of having code for every concept. And so if there's a concept that you talk about, that, that, that you use when you describe how your application works to another developer, they ought to be able to go in the code and see the code for that concept. And so we saw this just a second ago with BV Tracker, where we have this concept of tracking when a user does something and tracking when there's an error. And so before, there was no one place where they could go and see all the different things that we could track and how we tracked them and what the signature was to do it and all that. Now we have this BV Tracker object, which is where a developer can go and learn about this. And now there are tests, so we know that it works. And so having a code for this concept of tracking makes it easier to understand and makes it so you don't need to know so much about how it works under the hood. In our application, we use these configurable components. So this is an example of a portion of a component configuration um, for our review content list. And in, when I showed up, we, had, we were passing around these raw objects. So when we needed to you know, initialize a view for a component, we had this init object that had an init view method that would receive this raw component object and use that to initialize the view. Of course, we stored all of these raw component objects on ENV, shocker. Um, and, and so we, when I showed up and I wanted to know like, what is a component? Like, what does that mean? How do we use them? How do they, is this, a component or is this like part of a component? I don't understand. I was really, really confused and we were using this term all the time to talk about how our application worked. You know, Alex would say we have components and they have features, and that, but I couldn't go into the code and see what the heck a component was. I just saw these objects being passed around uh, and then, and, and, but they, there was no thing that was a component. And so a huge part of the time that I've spent is actually making this component be a thing, be a documented thing, be a tested thing, so that now when you're a new developer, you can go see, when we're talking about components, you can go see the code that is making that whole system that is the underpinning of our framework. We can see the code that's making that work. And so now we iterate over the array of component objects and we make a new component. And then we tell the component to init its view, rather than having this init view function that might be totally separated from something else that we do with components. Now everything that we do with components is a method on the component class. Uh, dirty words, sorry. 
Another thing that we've done that I can't emphasize enough is to automate everything, no matter what this XKCD comic says. Automate everything, especially when you're working with a large team, a large code base, with a bunch of developers of different skills. We are, most of the people in this room are probably really good troubleshooters. You're probably really good at figuring out when something doesn't work on the command line, you, you, you might be pretty good at figuring out why that is. Um, pe people of all different skills will have strengths in some areas and not in others. And so the more you can automate these rote tasks, the better off you'll be. So one thing that we have is this internal tool. I can't emphasize enough, make one of these. Make an internal tool that you throw in a client name and it pulls up the whatever information you might need about a client, their configuration, a demo, of, a, a preview of their site, a preview of their site um, using development code, whatever. So we have this tool and the great thing about having this tool that automates these tasks that otherwise they would be going into the you know, admin tool and clicking on this and click. The old process for doing some of the things on this page was like a lot of clicking. And now there's not so much clicking. You just type something in, boom, you have what you need on the page. Very developer focused rather than uh, end user focused or customer focused or non-technical person focused. Like this is a developer focused tool. This is a tool focused on making it easier for developers to do their job. And the great thing is that once you have a tool like this, you won't think twice about adding more things to it. So once you go through that hard work of setting up this, the first piece of functionality in a tool like this, then you won't think twice about, uh, you, now you have this place where I want to have performance graphs of different instances. Oh, we'll put that in what we call FBI, Firebird Inspector. Uh, I want to have, um, I want to see how many errors there are on clients, or I want to see how many page views there are on clients. We'll just throw that in Firebird Inspector. We'll throw that data in there. We weren't happy with just that, though, so we've used Grunt to automate a lot of this on the command line in addition. So now you can just say, hey, give me a preview URL for this client in the QA environment, and it'll spit out how you can get to all of that data. So Grunt is amazing for this sort of automation. We also have tasks for scaffolding a new feature, like I said. So just like in Rails land, where you say Rails G and it generates you all the code you need for a new feature, you can say Grunt feature and then the feature name, and it will generate code to get a basic working feature into the system for you. Uh, we, of course, automate running our tests. And we automate getting, the, getting our environment back to a happy place because sometimes you'll get your environment into a sad place and you need to kind of blow away all of your config files. And all of these things were things that, you know, they, some of them existed when I showed up, some of them we've added since I showed up. It's, it, it's all just a matter, with the automation especially, it's all just a matter of listening to the people around you and what is hard for them and either giving them a gentle, a gentle nudge to fit to automate whatever they just struggled through or doing it yourself um, if you're lucky enough to be in a role like mine where that's my job to do that. You already probably know you should be documenting everything, right? I don't, I don't actually agree that you should necessarily document everything. I think that <coughs> well-written code that's mo modularized, um, small methods that do one thing and do one thing well, you know, doing all of that will alleviate a lot of the need for, say, API documentation. Developers should be able to go read code to figure out how code works. But there are some things that even the best code can't tell you. And so document the kind of rationale behind your tool. The high level of this is how it works. This is the problem we're trying to solve. And this is, at a very high level, this is how we solved it. Document how to do things. How do I make a new feature? You know, that the code can't tell you. You can go look at other features, but often figuring out how do I get started is really hard. So document how to do things. Document how to fix things. Document where to find things in your code base. And if you can't say what a directory is for, you're doing it wrong. Make the directory do less. Uh, document the things you wish you didn't have to document, like how to use Git in your, like how you are using Git on this project, how, whether you do feature branches in your own repo or whatever, document things like that, that maybe when you were a small team, you all just agreed on with a handshake, but now as your team is growing, you need to share this. Uh, treat your code, if you have 
more than a tiny handful of developers working on a project like this, treat your code like an open source project. Have a change log every week that says, not these are the new features we made, like the new customer facing features we made, but hey, I changed how this method works and you're gonna wanna know about that. And so have a change log, treat your project like an open source project so that uh, other developers can know what's going on, just like hopefully they know what's going on in a, in a well-maintained open source project. And finally, put it all in the repo, at least to start. You know, don't put it on your company wiki. That's not where your developers are working every day. Uh, I think that a company wiki is just not a great place if it's documentation about the code, it belongs as close to the code as possible. Lastly, measuring things. And this, was, this is something that's important, and I have no idea what the answer is, because how do you measure developer happiness? Like, you can measure attrition, but that's kind of a terrible way to find out that you didn't do a good job. Uh, it, it's really hard to quantify the speed of feature delivery. You can't really, you know, feature A is not equivalent to feature B. You can't say, oh, feature A took two weeks and now it only takes one, but it's a different feature. It does it. You can't make a good comparison. A couple of things you can do is make sure that these changes that you're making aren't making things worse. Uh, so we keep an eye on the cyclomatic complexity of our code and some other complexity metrics to make sure that we're not doing anything terrible uh, in this refactoring, that our overall complexity is either staying the same or going down. And also the complexity, this is a grunt, uh, grunt plugin called Complexity Report. And it's a great way to also kind of identify, oh, maybe I should spend some time looking at that file because it is reporting that it is less maintainable or more complex than other files uh, in, the, in the code base. You can also make sure that you aren't making any performance uh, on improvements. Um, so that's another thing that we're doing is keeping an eye, I have no idea what this little jag is at the beginning, I kind of need to figure that out, because uh, that's bad, but it's going back down, so that's good. So you can, you can keep an eye on how, your, how these changes are affecting the performance of your code. But probably the, the best measurement I have of whether this is working and whether I'm doing my job is just listening to the people around me and listening to what they're saying and I'm getting a lot of good feedback about like, I wish I had this, you mean I can just do this? Um, or you know, th those sorts of things. Hearing success stories, that's, that's not a very objective measurement, but it's a nice one. Uh, and I think so much of this is just about listening to people, listening to people when they say nice things and listening to what they're complaining about and going in and fixing it. And I think that even, maybe you aren't lucky enough to have someone whose dedicated role is this on your team, but I'll tell you what, if you nominate yourself to be that person and just start doing it, you're gonna have a new and better job really soon. Uh, either at the company you're at or somewhere else who's gonna appreciate this sort of, uh, this sort of thinking about how to make things better and not just doing your job. So are we there yet? Is it, am I done? Um, that would be nice, because I'm about to disappear for uh, parental leave, but I think that this requires constant vigilance. You can't, there's no time when you're done. There's a time when maybe you aren't spending as much time on these sorts of things, but there's no time when you're done ensuring that developers can work with your framework. And so that means doing code reviews, reading every single pull request and just knowing what's going on, doing the change logs so that you kind of have a sense of the churn that's going on. Um, eavesdropping on planning conversations that maybe you weren't involved in, uh, or maybe you don't strictly need to be involved in, but listening to what's coming down the pipeline so you can get involved in conversations about how you can solve those problems or uh, write those features so that you aren't creating more problems down the road. Um, yeah, that's me. This is, uh, this is the team I have been working with for the last, the last three months. They're amazing. And um, we're hiring, of course, because everyone in this room is. But uh, come find me on Twitter or on the internet. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you.